discussing the many threads that make up the conspiracy cardigan, and we pull on as many as we can in this show. Please do make sure you're sitting down. Project Camelot and the Higher Side Chats in one show together might be enough to cause some fainting out there. Take a break on the heavy machinery. We don't want anyone getting hurt. And if this is your first time listening to the Higher Side Chats, don't worry. I do accept your apology, but there are a lot of great shows you've missed. So get over to thehiresidechats.com. Start combing through those archives. We got everything from Professor Griff to Jordan Maxwell, Jim Mars to Michael Tassarion, David Politis to Duncan Trussell, and more than you would want to have me list here. So do be sure to get with the program, and let's dive into it. A show about false flags, the war on comedians, raptors, dolphins, underground bases, secret alliances with ETs, Edward Snowden, and a little Atlanta sprinkled on top for good measure with Project Camelot's Gary Cassidy. Here's a chance to run down the rabbit hole He's asking who is really running the show Pull back the curtain and take a peek Puppet masters play hide and seek Not a sunny walk to there and back Greg likes it weird on the higher side chat All right, folks, today is quite a treat because as much time as we try to spend at the deepest depths of the conspiratorial rabbit hole, it's only a drop in the bucket compared to today's guest. She's the godmother of Conspiracy Radio. Her name is Carrie Cassidy, the woman behind Project Camelot. Most of you probably know her well, but she's been interviewing the creme de la creme of conspiracy whistleblowers for almost a decade now which gives her a unique insight into the goings-on of the planet's puppet masters of the Power Pyramid, and I am super psyched to hear her thoughts on a whole host of strange topics, so let's dive into it. Carrie Cassidy, welcome to THC. Hi, Greg. Thank you for me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, Carrie, thanks so much for being here. I've been listening to your interviews for several years. Always interesting. You're clearly at the forefront of conspiracy journalism. And just in the time since we've scheduled this interview, we've had another major event with the shooting at this French magazine. And we've learned enough by now to know that events are never really what they seem, with the true perpetrators usually putting the blame on some third party. Or we've even seen cases where they seem to have staged the entire event with crisis actors and wag the dog style media tricks. And I know you've been looking at this particular event pretty extensively. So tell us what you're seeing on this one, Carrie. Oh, uh, well, it's clearly a false flag, what we call a false flag. And uh, the purpose, as you know, uh, they just put apparently 10,000 troops on the streets in France. And that was yesterday's news. Uh, I haven't had a chance to actually see what might have transpired since then. But I can say there are so many parts of that story that don't hold up. Uh, I've written a number of articles about it, looked into the details and so on. Uh, There's very clear video showing, for example, that the police officer on the ground, uh, the AK-47, did not shoot him in the head. It it actually misses him on purpose, um, shooting the ground near him. And initially I thought, uh, well, they just shot the ground on purpose and and that was part of the staging. But Gordon Duff on Veterans Today has uh, actually said that even that they weren't just shooting blanks, they were shooting some kind of air pellets or whatever kind of thing out of the gun uh, that sort of disturbed the cement slightly, but didn't do what a a real AK-47 would have done to the cement there. So... So that was uh, ridiculous. There are so many things. Uh, <laughs> uh, one of the guys is is making a mad escape right in the midst of, of so-called battle and uh, picks up a shoe <laughs> that has somehow uh, emerged from out of the car or perhaps someone it was in the Paris street when they drove up. Or uh, maybe they'd done some rehearsals there and and somebody lost a shoe. I have no idea what. (laughs) But the guy has clearly got shoes on his feet. You can see in several frames. So it's not his shoe. It's not his partner's shoe. So whose shoe is it? Or at least uh, not, not, you know, he's got two shoes on. So, you know, there's, there's all these ridiculous things. Uh, It's, it's like laughable and, and, and sad at the same time. Right. The question is, uh, You know, well, the question I always have is, okay, where are the victims and where are the, um, the, you know, where are the bodies of the dead people? You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Um, In other words, they're they're mourning these people. There certainly have to be, I think there were something like supposedly 11 people wounded, nobody being interviewed by the news as far as I can tell. Uh, 
it, you know, because we know the outside situation was staged. Then on top of it, a very convenient nabbing of the so-called perpetrators to the guys uh, supposedly left their ID in the car so conveniently that they were <laughs> easily found. Um, this is just, you know, 9-11 stop, sort of nonsense going on, uh, like the passports found at 9-11. You know, see, to me, the disdain of the people that, that orchestrate these things, just banking on the stupidity of humanity and then driving people like us, the conspiracy, so-called conspiracy uh, crazies over here who actually have, you know, run down these details and and, and know what's really going on. Um, just crazy because it's it's just it's just pure arrogance mm -hmm. uh, they just don't give a shit anymore <laughs> <laughs> no they really don't do they but it does seem kind of odd because i've been spending a lot of time on your blog before this show and i've looked at the evidence you're talking about i've seen it it does make a compelling case that some of what were shown on tv was faked we've seen this other times too but i can't wrap my head around why they would do this because it seems like we know they don't care about human life. So if they're trying to get away with a false flag, why involve all these crisis actors and planners and special effects, bringing it all to town? When the more elaborate you get, the easier it is to have slip-ups that like you and Gordon Duff have been detailing. And the more people you get involved, the more likely the secret will get out. It just seems so much simpler and easier to send in a few specialists with guns and shoot the place up and get out of there. <laughs> I mean, you know what I'm saying? I'm not trying to deny the angle of a stage simulation. It just seems way sloppier and more complex than it needs to be when you can just use real weapons and real assassins, and then you don't have to put in all this effort into making it look real. Well, I mean, I, I think I don't think it can be, you know, sort of black and white uh, in their scenario because keep in mind that they have to make it appear as though something real is going on because you've got your middle managers uh, that need to be brought on board and need to play their roles appropriately. So they can't be completely read in. Um, and we've got layers. It's like, uh, like Richard Hoagland says, layers of the onion. Uh, so we've got a certain level of middle managers, uh, like the police officer now that supposedly suicided himself right. uh, a day later while writing up the report on the Charlie Hebdo thing. You know, th this is also absurd because uh, th this is a clear hit. This is just one of the many things they do to get rid of witnesses that know too much. And obviously the two guys who actually were hired or, or uh, you know, mind controlled to do the action or even volunteered stupidly, um, maybe for a lot of money, had to be had to be killed, uh, so they couldn't talk. In mm -hmm. other words, so they're they're actually, I would say, walking a thin line um, between, you know, what they're doing, selling it to the masses so that it looks realistic, selling it to lower managers and middle managers that need to be bought in, uh, so that they run out and run around and do whatever they're going to do. Um, you know, investigating and so on. So mm -hmm. they don't become suspicious in the process. And then, uh, and well-intentioned people like the guy probably writing his report, perfectly well-intentioned guy, right? Unfortunately, he, he started to realize there were too many th anomalies and, and that had to, then they have to do away with someone like that when they're, when they're too wide awake and too smart. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is what we're do what's going on. I mean, I think that when people start to paint everything black and white, you lose your perspective. And so it's very important to keep a sense that these people are always walking in what the shadows. Mm -hmm. They're always working in that area where things can be, can be, can appear to be not what they are. And yet on the same time, uh, they can deceive huge masses of people and they can, they can carry out their, uh, their magical act keeping in mind that a lot of these things that they're doing false flags are occult sort of um, acts that ha that are wrapped in uh, magical sim symbolism so that they can carry out a certain energetic uh, change in in the fabric of, of humanity and so on. So, right. so it, it has some deeper levels going on. Yeah, yeah, it definitely does. And well said. But now let me ask you, who do you think is ultimately responsible for this attack? Does this look like another CIA Mossad type operation, in your opinion? Well, I would certainly say those are the usual suspects. <laughs> <laughs> True. Uh, but I, I, you know, um, obviously I can't claim knowledge on that. I can say that, you know, it, 
it is interesting to me that this is um, this is the way they've chosen to move forward at this time. I think that that what happens is they are also dealing with a certain portion of the population, which is a growing portion, which are people like you and I who aren't, who aren't buying any of it. Mm -hmm. And that war on terror idea is just has been ludicrous from the beginning. Anyone who knows that at this point, and most people should, but of course they don't, that 9-11 was an inside job. I mean, governments are, are aware that 9-11 was an inside job. Right. So when you just extrapolate from there, then they know the war on terror is a facade. They have to know at that point, if you have somebody who's read in in government enough to know it's a facade, then you need to give them a rationale for why you would you would do something like that to keep them on board so they don't talk. Now, fear is one thing, payoffs are another, but uh, getting somebody intellectually uh, bought in to your concept is also something that they would endeavor to do. So, so I think that that this is um, sort of a complex playing field that 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 we're entering at this time. In other words, um, perception is uh, what do they say? Ninety percent of the <laughs> the thing. <laughs> Um, you know, it, it's all about, uh, well, as, as Jim Morrison would say, but he borrowed it from, um, from what's his name, but doors of perception, you know, it, mm -hmm. at the point, Aldous Huxley, I believe. Yes. We're in a hall of mirrors and, uh, that, that goes, that has to do with everything. It has to do with perception of truth right now. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people not understanding some, some people wanting to see things in black and white, something people uh, hearing one thing and want to paint it in one way when in fact it might be its opposite. Do you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, um, it's really important. I think that people don't rush to judgment the minute they hear anything. Um, because just rushing to judgment saying, okay, false flag, is it a blanket fake happening or are there some people that really were killed? Mm -hmm. Um, which ones were killed? Why were those particular ones killed and not others? You know, you have to wrap your mind around all the details. I, I think it behooves us to think critically, you know, going forward. Oh, of course. Uh, it's definitely an interesting bullet point on the elite's agenda. It happened, you know, right at the beginning of this year, and we really do need to let the dust kind of settle to see exactly how it plays out and what they're going to try to usher in as a result. Um, these troops on the ground doesn't sound good. The talks about internet censorship and that people can't be criticizing their government online. I've heard a lot of that coming out of world leaders. So it does kind of fit that pattern of fake an event, bring in the agenda. They've been doing it to us for a very long time. And this is just another uh, another step on that path. But yes. uh, another thing I, I really did want to ask you about was these interviews with Captain Mark Richards. These are pretty awesome. Apparently, this guy is in jail because the elite framed him for a murder. And you have to go into this prison and transcribe the interviews with them. And he has some very interesting information on a whole host of topics, uh, one being Robin Williams. I guess, can you tell us a little bit about the guy and um, his connection to Robin Williams? Oh, sure. Uh, well, they were, they grew up together, uh, in the same area, Marin County. And I, I guess if I recall, they, they went to the same, uh, college or junior college, can't remember which, I think it was college. And, and so, yeah, they were friends. Uh, he kept in touch with him over the years. Apparently his most recent wife tried to put a wedge between the two and did not want Robin for whatever reason. And this becomes suspicious in and of itself, uh, to write to Mark. And so their correspondence uh, did fall off over the last few years, from what I understand. But he maintains a, um, a clear perspective on who Robin is and, and Robin's perspective on the world, etc. And it was very astute in his analysis of what happened, uh, what was said to be a suicide, basically saying that just isn't Robin. It's not what he would do. It's not his style. It's not his approach to life. And... Uh, and that he was read in uh, on certain levels that, uh, you know, that Mark is and that you and I are, but but perhaps even deeper than than the average person who's involved in this subject matter. In other words, because he knew Mark, for one thing, um, possibly also because of his celebrity status, he, he was privy to a certain amount of information that made him knowledgeable on a certain level. Mm -hmm. uh, when you're like that, as you may consider yourself – you have even less desire to kill yourself under any circumstance because you're you're in a battle 
uh, for planet Earth. You're in a battle on behalf of humanity. So therefore, your life is is dedicated to service to humanity. So therefore, you wouldn't do a sort of a what is in essence a self-serving act like suicide. Mm-hmm. Sad to say. Um, and, you know, I, I, I realize that's somewhat of a blanket statement because, uh, you know, I don't like to criticize people that get to a very desperate place. But the bottom line is, um, you know, one has to sort of uh, psychoanalyze on a certain level. What is it they say someone does, like in Robin's case? Um, I thought it was appropriate because Mark said if he was going to do something like that, he'd jump off the Golden Gate Bridge. You know, he'd do something uh, spectacular. Mm-hmm. And I think those of us who watched Robin over the years and and loved his work and so on would also agree this man uh, – this man is not going to hang himself from a doorknob or whatever the hell it ended up to be. Mm-hmm. And the wife in the other room, I'm with kids. You know, I mean, um, no, I don't buy it. You know, it, it's it's a hit. Uh, he, he got too close to something. That's clear. And Joan Rivers, well, uh, there's a lot of uh, talk about uh, that also. What appears to be the case, and this actually has gone on for years, uh, Lenny Bruce, I think his name was, uh, years ago, a very famous comedian, yeah. excellent comedian, was uh, was taken out. Um, there have been others. I know Richard Pryor uh, has been targeted. I can't remember if he's he's um, alive or not. I, oh, he's definitely, he died. He died, but I, I believe I, it was an old, old, old age. Yeah. Um, well, I, I see they target comedians. Uh, comedians are leaders of you know, have a lot of public influence. They're, they're, um, they're leaders in their own right and, uh, major celebrities. Uh, there's a reason why they want to go after comedians. Uh, now I don't know what the Charlie Hebdo newspaper really was about because I never, you know, I don't read French and mm-hmm. so on, but, um, uh, they say they parodied all the various religions and so on, that they were critical, that they were funny, this is again the kind of thing they're going after right now. It appears there's a a, a renewed effort to go after uh, comics and that sort of sensibility. See, if you have humor, you are stepping back from the matrix on a certain level. Right. You are uh, you have to have a certain level of um, skepticism, especially when you when you have dry humor, for example. Um, so you can see how that's threatening to people who want you deep in the matrix, who want you to be deceived by everything they do. Uh, humor thrives on truth. Absolutely. So therefore they want to cut that off at the knees at a time when they want people to be anything but truthful. They want, uh, them, them living in a, in a world of fantasy and, uh, and be, be persuaded by the nonsense that they, they conduct, um, the smoke and mirrors again. Absolutely. I could not agree with you more. I, I used to want to go into the comedy field and instead went into the conspiracy field. And then I see how closely related they really are. I mean, guys like Dave Chappelle and Cat Williams have been victims of it, but also another thing in uh, recent news is this Bill Cosby saga. And I'm hearing two sides because there's the one side that says, Higher ups in the Hollywood elite obviously are taking advantage of uh, g- young girls, young kids. We have that thread that's very pervasive. And then also there's the idea that as a comedian, he's being, quote unquote, taken out in a way by being completely marginalized and his career is destroyed. He is effectively dead. So it's I'm very curious on what side of the fence you might be on on this one. Yeah, the same thing happened to uh, Robin, um, not Robin Williams, uh, well, Yes, Robin Williams, but um, to actually, um, Michael Woody Jackson. Allen. Oh, oh well, certainly they took out Michael Jackson, but he wasn't per se a comedian. But uh, no, Woody Allen. Um, look, I I don't know how how truthful it was. Um, it it seems convenient. Uh, it I think nearly destroyed the guy's career. Again, we have a a comedian who is used to looking at the truth, making fun of, of the, um, the nonsense that goes on Mm -hmm. the the social so-called mores, the rules and regulations that most people follow unquestioning, unquestionably, they, they will uh, point to, they will wake people up on that level. So, um, so yeah, there's a reason to go after these guys. Uh, I don't, uh, again, I'm not following the details on Cosby, but I can say it's, it fits a pattern mm-hmm. that's happening right now. And this is a frightening pattern. 
I would say that there are many other things also that that I wanted to kind of bring up about Mark Richards because sure. certainly that was a, a, a small part portion of our interview last time. I've actually interviewed him three times now. So I, I go up to the prison where he's being held in Northern California. Um, I, I'm accompanied by his wife, Joanne Richards, who is, she's a speaker on the circuit, lovely woman, very intelligent. And she's been out there talking about Mar- uh, Mark Richards and, and his work for a long time. She publishes his work and does writing of her own. And, and, you know, they, they're quite a formidable team, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Uh, And uh, he's, you know, he's just amazing. That's all I can say about him. He's, uh, he's extremely uh, intelligent, very well read. (laughs) He is, he's somebody that they had to come up with a, a, again, a sort of a false flag accusation in order to make it fly. It had to be so outlandish. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And it is. You know, and then he gets he gets thrown in jail over it. Uh, I, I can tell you that back channel just recently, I had someone who through a third party tried to, um, well, contacted a, uh, I guess, a candidate for governor or, or for some office here in California, who then was looking into the Mark Richards case about getting him released. He's been in, in prison for 30 years on these charges. And the guy uh, got a visit by um, several so-called men in black, and uh, he he withdrew his you know his um, candidacy, and he he disappeared. He 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 went off grid. So uh, then there was another person who um, a, a young person. I'm just trying to be as vague as possible to keep uh, the heat away from these people, but apparently was also threatened. Received a visit uh, when uh, that person went to look for some some records on the trial. Uh, that that were not easy to obtain. So um, so this is what they do. They they get somebody trumped up on charges who has a great deal of knowledge, who was a renegade even when he was in the secret space program, a known renegade. He writes about it, so you can read his read his books, which are available. Um, well, they're publications and, and soon to be books uh, that Joanne sells for very small prices on. Um, on her website, Earth Defense, I haven't got it in front of me. So it um, starts with the word Earth Defense, I believe. Right on. And um, it's on my website. Okay, it, it is on your website. But th- yeah, this Mark Richards guy, very interesting. Apparently he flew a craft for the secret space program before they put him in jail. Oh, yeah. I mean, he was captain. He was like, a, you know, I, I guess you you know might say um, like an enterprise mission type of captain. Wow. So he yeah. was, uh, you know, very high level, uh, an officer and conducts himself even to this day uh, in that manner. You know, he is, uh, I noticed that the other, uh, the men in prison are very uh, respectful of him. Uh, there are attempts of his, on his life periodically in the prison. He's uh, highly skilled in self-defense as one can assume and, and is actually the case, <laughs> but it doesn't stop them from trying from time to time. Various factions uh, there are other factions. There are some people trying to keep him alive while he's in prison. Mm-hmm. Uh, they have a vested interest in not letting this man out. Right. So my interviews with him are uh, covering all sorts of things. He was really flying interstellar, uh, even making jumps uh, interdimensionally. From what I understand, talks about special fuel from neutron stars that they've now uh, gotten access to that is beyond what he says, uh, beyond free energy and allows them to go interstellar and interdimensionally. Um, He says various ET races are not happy about that. You know, there's so much to the interviews. It would not even be possible to, to, to go into all the details, but you know, if you have specific questions, I'm happy to answer them. Absolutely. I actually do. Um, one aspect to this, you know, we hear about a lot of different alien races, but he specifically talks about this alien race of raptors, which is really interesting. I guess they, were, you know, were told all the dinosaurs went extinct 65 million years ago. But according to Mark, this raptor faction of intelligent beings used some type of secret energy. They stole some type of uh, technology and actually got off planet. Is that right? Yes. And apparently after uh, some delay in which they were, uh, I guess, poised on the edge of the galactic center for a period of time, uh, unclear of where they were, had sort of lost their way. 
uh, their spaceships made it to a planet in the Draco system that they then, uh, I guess, terraformed and took over. That That's where their race um, sort of evolves since that point. Uh, but a portion of them stayed behind, apparently, uh, went underground and if I understand the story correctly, are um, are now the enemies of humans and the enemies of that other faction of of Drake of um, Raptor. So we have, in other words, uh, a split in their own group, and uh, just like humans, <laughs> right? And 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 so they have come back to uh, to align themselves with humans. They found they looked into the future. Um, their queen, as I think they call her. It, it was, has the a ability to look into the future and saw that if they align themselves with humans on a positive note, that they um, their future was positive. So they uh, changed their traje- trajectory instead of um, you, seeing us as the enemy and eating us. In essence, they uh, they became uh, aligned with a certain faction of our military, mm-hmm. and that's uh, they are now working with them. Apparently, they worked with them in. Um, Oh gosh, uh, the Falkland Falklands War, and uh, I think that's around the time when the turning point happened. They made a treaty with humans, and uh, basically, they they consider Earth their home. It's it is their original home. But there is a, at least I'm told at least two two races of reptilians here on Earth who are um, enemies of of humans and uh, want to see us off the planet. Man. Uh, another thing on this raptor faction, apparently a part of their changing their tune with humanity is that they're working with Hollywood, I guess, to improve the perception of raptors, which I think is really interesting because we have a new Jurassic Park movie coming out this year. It'll be interesting to see how the raptors are perceived in that movie. <laughs> but apparently there's a movie or something called Walking with Dinosaurs that they might have actually appeared in next to CG dinosaurs. Yeah, that's what Mark says. I mean, you know, I wow. I mean, the jury's still out on that one, I have to say, of course. I got to watch it at least. Yeah, well, actually, um, Walking with Dinosaurs is is not a movie. It's a, at least to my knowledge, it's, uh, it's a live the- theatrical show. Oh, okay, okay. Um, and it, it, it travels around the world and apparently is coming to Sacramento. Um, sometime, maybe even this month, if I recall, I can't remember when I interviewed him exactly. He said it was, it was an upcoming date. Um, you know, I am rather interested to, to go see that for that purpose. Absolutely. Yeah. I don't know how they'd carry out something like that. Uh, but I think it's fascinating. I think it's, uh, it does sound like they have, you know, as, it's. I, I know that it's. This sounds outlandish to people when they listen, especially if you're not, um, you know, a, not a not sort of a contactee, and you haven't really gone down the rabbit hole in this regard. But I can say that if you extrapolate what 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 goes on and and the um, sort of re evolution, if you will, of humanity uh, back to source, then you can understand that all different beings are also on that same journey. And along that journey, um, it's not out of the question to assume that that uh, a dinosaur species would would then develop. First of all, that was fairly intelligent, even as you know, run of the mill di- dinosaurs mm-hmm. vying for for control of the planet, even back in in the you know the days that people uh, well hear about uh, sixty five million years ago, or whatever they say it was, and. Then to have evolved uh, even higher intelligence from there, in spite of their physicality, you know what I'm saying, right. or maybe even uh, with the aid of it. And uh, apparently, in the uh, multiverse, uh, the sort of reptilian form is, um, you know, is is a completely viable, durable form. So this is just the form spirit takes. On a certain level, they don't have to also remain on the negative side of service to self, as we call it. There, there are transitional um, groups of reptilians that have moved over to the other side, uh, just as humans are in the process of doing. Mm-hmm. So it behooves people, I think, to think in terms of spirituality when you look at this sector and not simply uh, nuts and bolts practicality. Absolutely. I totally agree. And this is a very open-minded audience. We love to get to that deep level stuff. And, you know, this is somewhat new to me, but not outside of the realm of uh, similar things that we've talked about before. But, uh, you know, I'm super glad that you could come here because it's only been a half hour. We're already getting into some pretty, pretty wild (laughs) stuff. But 
I mean, that does lead me to ask you, how do you vet someone? How do we separate the real stuff from people who just want attention or are trying to sell books or even worse, are active disinfo agents? How can we kind of separate the wheat from the chaff in this realm? It's so tough. Absolutely. Well, let me say that, first of all, I've been doing this for nearly nine years, uh, which is kind of around the clock occupation. I don't just close. <laughs> I don't just come home and, 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 and it's all over. I'm constantly, um, if you, you might call it on call and, uh, and being, um, communicated with from various sources that have contacted me in the past, uh, and, and, and so on. So this is an ongoing investigation, I, I think is the best way to look at it. And, um, and 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 I am open minded along those lines. But in terms of determining what's truth from fiction, in the early days of Camelot, uh, first of all, I did a lot of meditation before I ever entered Camelot, and I also did a great deal of investigation. And I also worked at JPL Jet Propulsion Lab in communications. So I wasn't really in science, but I was uh, hired because of my skills because I'd worked for twenty years in Hollywood. And they wanted to uh, to utilize some of my um, sort of skills to entertain and communicate at the same time, right? Mm -hmm. um, so while I was there, I saw sort of close up the what you might call NASA's community because JPL is really uh, very deeply connected to NASA um, for all intents and purposes. And at any rate, um, so I, I really saw things very close to the inside at that point. But I also grew up in Northern California and I was born in Moffett Field that as it happens years later, uh, I found out is it has a huge underground base. Oh. And I interviewed uh, Norm Bergram, who is um, a very fascinating scientist who is in his 80s, believe it or not, when I interviewed him. Uh, he was the one who wrote the book uh, Ring Mater Makers of Saturn and uh, posited that ships were in the in were making those rings in in Sa uh, around Saturn and that that those ships were on the way here. And um, this was many years ago that he wrote the book. Um, and we were referred to him by John Lear, for those that are interested, uh, and highly recommend that interview with uh, well, with both men, actually, but you know. <laughs> Norm Bergman in this case. And, and at one point he, he just, um, you know, when I told him I was born at Moffat field hospital, he, um, he gave me a look and, uh, and, and that look told me many, many things. Um, I'm, I am psychic. Uh, it has proven itself over time to me and been very useful in determining, uh, you know, the path Camelot should take, whether we should interview one person or not interview someone else, et cetera. Another thing that in terms of the way we work, we, we do triangulate information. So and just like the intelligence agencies, we basically look for three sources who are, which are unrelated, that are coming from completely different directions that don't know each other, and they are all uh, talking about the same thing. At that point, it is considered something worth investigating on a deeper level. Sometimes I don't always have those three sources. Although, um, you know, sometimes I'll start out with the one source, the other two will start to emerge sometimes months, sometimes days, sometimes years later. So it's like you stay on the investigation and as things come up, you, you track whether or not they have appeared before and then they start to grit, sort of gain credence as, as you move forward. But the other thing that I do, aside from using psychic perception and what is in essence this triangulation of information, uh, prior you know investigations I've done, uh, and in the case when I used to have a partner, Bill Ryan, um, the both of us had a strong background in investigating this sector before we got into it. So that that was very helpful because you begin to separate the truth from the falsity, even as you investigate on your own. Mm -hmm. And then ultimately, um, you know, we, we get to know our witnesses very well. It's not just a one shot deal. Oftentimes they, they become friends later. Sometimes they turn on us in, in most inexplicable ways that indicate, uh, programming and targeting, uh, electronically by the powers that be mm. super soldiers are absolutely notorious in that way. Um, but, uh, you know, the last thing I would say is, is, is what resonates. And that is a, um, 
I, I think one of the best methods for determining what's true and what's false. And it means that you use more than just your intellect to determine whether something is, is true or whether a person is worth listening to and whether they're true or false. And you're bringing in the heart, the emotional body, um, along with the mental body. Um, you're uh, bringing in all your senses beyond the six that we conventionally think of humans having. And, and you begin to sort of access, access your own sort of abilities in these areas. And in doing so, you open your up yourself up and you, you begin to feel what in essence resonates. And there's mm -hmm. in a, in a certain level, there's, um, there's really a physiological component to resonation, you know, so to when something resonates. Yeah. You, you just got to use that internal barometer and trust yourself a little bit, but uh, let's get into a little bit of this subtext about the ET races. You touched on it a little bit, but we hear so much about them aligning with different governments on the planet. Apparently, from some people, they're saying that the U.S. and Israel are working with perhaps the Anunnaki. Russia and China have their own groups. It gets very muddy. Can you kind of tell us about with these global superpowers, who's kind of aligned with who? Uh, well, yeah, it's, 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 it's kind of a mess out there. Uh, I can say that even when you look at the, uh, the military here in, in America, militaries are aligned with different groups. So <laughs> when you've got militaries within your own country that are aligning themselves with uh, certain factions, in other words, it is said early on that the army was aligning themselves with greys. And those greys had a negative agenda for humanity unbeknownst to the army at the time. Um, or at least portions of the army. Uh, the CIA is certainly aligning itself with various different factions, I would say. At this time, there's no doubt whatsoever. Navy, which has always sort of run the game behind the scenes uh, with regard to to the ET question, so to speak, um, has been aligned with various races and the Air Force with another race. Um, I think the Air Force are the ones that are most known for aligning first with the Raptors, for example, mm. and uh, certain members of the Navy. But Mark has a, a background in the, you know, as a captain in the Navy, but he also has done work for the Air Force um, and, and so on. So we, we know at this time, for example, I'm being told that the Chinese have aligned themselves with a certain race of um of negative oriented reptilians, uh, the same with, uh, with Iran, for example, uh, part of the problem we had with Japan in world war two was that they were aligned with a race of, of very, um, from what I understand, negatively oriented reptilians. And that an in interesting, uh, revelation that came out of one more, my more recent interview with Mark was that, uh, her, you know, Hiroshima and Nagasaki were, were bombed because they were trying to uh, eliminate a reptilian race underground mm. in those vicinities, their bases. Uh, so, so this is what we're dealing with. We're, we're really dealing with a, a huge mixture. And yes, Israel does seem to be aligned with a, a race of Anunnaki who have a base in underground, I'm told in Demona, although there could be other places, central places for them as well. Again, this is triangulated information, many times, uh, you know, corroborated by my various witnesses, high level witnesses that have already been vetted. In some cases, sometimes new people that come along with new stories that then corroborate former information. So when I'm talking about all of this, I am not just getting this from one source. This mm -hmm. is from multiple sources. Yeah. And that's what's so great about having you here because, you know, I'll interview someone and it's just that person's opinion kind of. And then we go to the next week and it's the totally opposite end of the spectrum. So this is great because you do have that kind of you can source from so many different areas and pull together a complete story. But it's so confusing and so integrated when it comes to the E.T. situation. I also saw a blog that you wrote that was pretty interesting where you talked about the banking crash of 2008 and how it actually had a lot to do with covering up alien investments in some of these banks, sometimes as much as three hundred million a day, according to I guess some of your whistleblowers. Uh, yeah, I, that sounds like uh, Mark Richards again, and uh, yeah, that was an, a very interesting component from uh, from his recent interview that he did with me. You know. <laughs> A fount of knowledge, let me just say that. Um, the man just, you know, and, and <laughs> it, I never know what I'm going to, going to get. Um, 
from him, you know, um, and, and some of these things come really out of what you might say left field. Like I wouldn't even know to ask, ask the question. And yet somehow if I ask a certain question, then he goes down a road that is oftentimes unexpected. And that was one of the areas, but yeah, I mean, it, 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 it's, it's fascinating that they are, um, that they are, well, the black projects, uh, the funding of the black projects, the funding of the secret space program, that story is a huge story. And that is a story that is of all the stories that we have in this sector, the most likely to cross over in my opinion, you know, into the mainstream Mm -hmm. because money talks, right? This is where people kind of are focused on this planet, you know, especially again in the mainstream. So when you start getting into the funding of black projects and the fun and where these monies come from, whether it be, you know, putting in your bank accounts uh, that are that where the owner is, is undisclosed and is in essence <laughs> a member of another race, mm-hmm. in essence, uh, you know, having to do business on this planet with what, you know, with money. Um, this is the, the energetic sort of means of of exchange. So uh, so that's what we have going on. We've also got an artificial intelligence that weighs in on, in this uh, this area. Mm. So that's where the Surveillance Society, Edward Snowden's disclosures. And it's important to understand that uh, I'm actually reading my second book on uh, on Snowden at this time and that there were a lot of nuances to the disclosures that were made, the method in which they were made and the journalists, uh, how they rolled out certain information in, in a certain sort of steady stream. Uh, and there's one book out there that, that I'm currently reading that is, um, and I'm going to see if I can find the title during our conversation here so I can put it, you know, just make people aware of it. What fascinates me about these stories when I get into mainstream investigations such as Snowden, I consider that mainstream, yeah. you know, is to look at uh, sort of this hall of mirrors and figure out, is this person a real whistleblower? If so, what is his investment? What is he trying to say? And what might be, um, you know, disinformation along those lines, et cetera, or what might be not recognized as uh, having the value that it really has. You can't throw these things just out out of hand and say, well, this person does this or that. It's just not, it, it, you know, it's not going to educate you as to what's really going on. So, so this is what um, I think it's really important people need to do. But um, I am looking to see which, uh, I think it's called the Snowden Files. Hmm. Uh, I think it, it's very important that people go down this rabbit hole because uh, what happens is, as you see with with the latest move with Charlie Hebdo, there's also a move to shut down freedom on the internet in a big way. Right. Freedom of press is always very threatening to them. And so in light of that, their their attacks and who they attack and why they attack is is crucial to to start to understand. And so this book is helpful in terms of telling the mainstream story about what went on. Um, actually, it's called The Edward Snowden Affair, I believe. So there's two books. One, The Snowden Files is very, very good. The one I am um, in the process of reading is uh, The Snowden Affair, Exposing the Politics and media behind behind what happened. And in that book, uh, the author is actually analyzing the legislation, the attempts at legislation, the attempts to shoot down legislation mm-hmm. as a result of the revelations that Snowden made. Now, that's pertinent because just recently, um, of course, the NSA is now once again um, trying to increase their access to uh, to our civil liberties and um, granting themselves new powers. Um, there's an article I was just looking at here, uh, NSA chief pushes a bill for granting new powers to the NSA. You can see how these false flags play into this in a big way. Right. And and I spend time in the UK right now uh, quite a bit on and off when, when possible. I have a place to stay there. And I've been watching that press and uh, and their leaders and Cameron and so on. And it's fascinating how they orchestrate their own sort of disinfo campaign towards those people is different than the way the United States handles their 
um, sort of their media and their disinfo campaign. So, um, so when you come from outside the country, I guess you, you sort of develop abilities to sort of see this in play. And you can probably look at France uh, from the outside and see how their press is, is playing into into these uh, deceptions as well. Fascinating study for people that might want to go down that road. <laughs> yeah, it's great to be able to have that insight of being on both sides. You know, I'm stuck here in the American bubble. And yeah, we have the internet. But I mean, even that only gets you so far. I did want to ask you a little bit about the Vatican, because I'm sure they have a very serious role to play. I've been told that they have their own shadow leadership, as well as maybe even being instrumental in collecting our negative energy and using their advanced observatories to kind of channel it into the right areas of space where maybe these spiritual archon-like parasites can harvest it. Uh, does, does that sound right to you? Or can you share any aspects of the role of the Vatican to us? Uh, actually, yeah, that sounds completely viable. Uh, <laughs> I, yeah, I can say that the evidence we have from people like Leo Zagami many years ago, who was a, a whistleblower from uh, the P2 Lodge, high level of the Illuminati occult, <clears throat> basically under the, the beck and call, I believe, of the, the Black Pope. I can say that, that he, he corroborated, as well as countless other witnesses, um, people that I've interviewed and people that have been off record talking about the reptilian base underneath the Vatican, what's going on there. Uh, according to Mark Richards, there's not just a, a, a reptilian base, but there's a base where ETs from all over off planet can go and that many negative ETs are welcomed there. And they supposedly have uh, or have to put their weapons aside while they're sort of there visiting. But this is the kind of thing, I mean, it's the duplicity in terms of the Vatican, uh, the Vatican Library, where the secrets are held, and from the Library of Alexandria, Sandria, where they were secreted there, the stuff is is just amazing. It is the deception. The levels of deception are are um, actually pretty mind boggling, and uh, I think we are we are beginning to delve, you know, down deeper and deeper into those deceptions. But I think there are still some levels in which. We haven't gotten a whistleblower. We haven't gotten uh, even psychic information, you know, looking forward and backward. Time. I consider it all of us time travelers. So if you want to look forward in, in time or backward in time, we have the ability to do that. Uh, you can also you can travel, uh, in essence, uh, with or without your physical body to these times. Uh, there, there are more secrets to be had, I'm sure, under the Vatican. Oh, yeah. I, I can only imagine the things we know or we only even the rumors we have. If, if someone doesn't talk about it, we don't know. So I'd assume at least more than half of the stuff is just a complete secret to even us, even people who are trying to get the answers when most of the mainstream could care less. But, you know, we're out there digging and it's even really hard to get more than just some unsubstantiated rumors. But uh, another thing I wanted to get into a couple of questions about understanding the planet, because so much of that is kind of a, a false reality that people are walking around in. And we have had some guests here who've talked about dolphins. And I'm kind of curious because some people say dolphins are really important. I've heard everything from them being some type of alien themselves to the idea that vaccines have been a campaign to cause autism in, in humans who have dolphin genetics of some type. It is a really weird area but it's, you, you know, you can't deny that there's a, an allure to dolphins and that there's uh, definitely some weird regulation in how we interact with dolphins. And I'm kind of curious if any of your whistleblowers have brought this up. Uh, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> I mean, Aaron McCullum, of course, is, a, I, I would say, a, what you might call a dolphin-human hybrid. Uh, there was a, he's a super mm. soldier that I interviewed um, several times and uh, kind of has gone off the grid at this time. But uh, I, I can say that this program, uh, he wasn't the only one coming forward with information about having uh, dolphin DNA and having memories of certain abilities uh, to, to breathe underwater and things of this nature. It's, uh, yeah, it's fascinating. I mean, there's no doubt that dolphins uh, are an ET race. I mean, we are an ET race for that mm -hmm. matter. Certain factions of us are different ET races. Uh, we are combinations of at least 12 uh, DNA from at least 12 different ET races. 
the human itself, this vehicle is, a, I believe, a, a hybrid. We are a hybrid race in essence. So with that in mind, that means that we have access to the so-called powers or superpowers, if you will, of all those 12 uh, races that we access on various levels and various uh, degrees, depending on the individual and their, their sort of, um, their mixture. So yes, uh, there's, there's a huge campaign within the military to use dolphins, um, to access their intelligence, to learn their language. Richard Allen Miller is someone who at a young age, a uh, brilliant uh, physicist who I've interviewed a number of times. He was deep in the, the secret space program for quite a while training super soldiers training uh special forces to use their uh and develop their uh, sort of beyond the six senses if you will but what one thing he did was work with uh i guess john Lilly and dolphins Mm -hmm. and 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 deciphering the the dolphin um language Mm. that was actually something he did Uh, on top of that dolphins have been used uh you know they're they're always trying to make uh, dolphin human hybrids because of the sort of the cross capabilities, I guess you might call it in terms of super soldier uh, things that are, that may, that, that are, there's such a, um, I mean, in a certain sense, our oceans are another form of space that is unexplored largely. Mm-hmm. Um, and so the abilities to go deeper into the oceans, to explore what's really there, certainly our history is uh, mu- much of the history of planet earth is buried beneath the oceans uh, so there's there's got to be motivation on that level because if you there's always an interest in the secret space program to get better technologies to learn more from the ancient past because humanity has had higher levels of civilization technologically than we have now and Atlantis was one of them we are now reaching the levels of Atlantis apparently. Um, and many of us have reincarnated from those times, if you want to call it that. So in answer to your question, uh, no doubt about it, dolphins are a T-race. Uh, very highly intelligent. I have swum with dolphins in Hawaii. And I, uh, I can tell you that they also exude um, energetics that, that puts you into an altered state. And uh, in, in swimming with them... I can say that I became so uh, dolphin, I don't know, um, maybe I have some empathic qualities, so perhaps totally empathic or or something beyond that. When I came, I knew uh, I was coming back to shore. I, um, I was approaching the shore after swimming with the dolphins at one point, and I couldn't remember that I had legs. Huh. I actually was trying to figure out how I was going to walk. Weird. You know, it was just a sort of a short couple second um, sort of <laughs> blank in my mind. But what it told me is how close we really are to dolphins. And I do believe that humans in general, at least some of us, have a strong uh, affinity and perhaps uh, some of our DNA, a larger portions of our DNA, be maybe more oriented towards that race of beings. Yeah. Wow. That is really interesting. I'm glad I asked that question. That was one of those things I wasn't, I wasn't sure what we'd get there. But on the topic of unexplored space, you know, you said much of it is under the ocean. There also apparently is a lot under the land as well. We hear about underground bases and even huge underground cities possibly. And that's pretty easy for me to believe. But then we also hear about these possible polar openings and the idea of an inner earth with its own continents and places like Agartha or Shangri-La. Do you think there's any validity to that idea that the planet could really be that different from what the mainstream is saying? Oh, absolutely. Um, You know, I mean, I think that the matrix in which we live, it lies on every level (laughs) and constantly. Mm -hmm. So um, there's actually nothing that I won't consider uh, pretty much uh, at this point. Uh, And Oh, yeah. I mean, there's no doubt about it. I, I've done a lot of investigation um, along these lines. I sort of got by accident into investigating uh, ancient uh, archaeology. And by going, first of all, I, I, I started visiting um, Michael Tellinger in South Africa. I went to Adam's Calendar. Mm. Now been to South Africa like four times to Adam's Calendar um, and to the Standing Stone sites uh, there. Um, you know, the, the Anunnaki influence in that particular place, the fact that that's 
clearly a portal on the side of a cliff, a very spectacular setting. The energetics are amazing. Uh, apparently computers go completely wacky within that stone circle and uh, so do, so do um, you know, compasses and all of that. This is just one of, of many sites on planet Earth. Uh, I also have been doing an investigation on Malta. Malta is a really spectacularly interesting place. I'm hoping to take a group there. Um, haven't been able to raise the money so far, uh, but but I'm looking into doing that. If not this spring, then next fall, if things go well. This is a, a highly secret place, a place where... Um, there are a lot of ET ruins, according to Mark Richards, uh, which I didn't know he knew anything about Malta. And I asked him about that, thinking um, that I wasn't that it wasn't going to go anywhere. And turns out he not only knows about Malta, uh, but he was planning to write a book about Malta, of all things. So, But the Vatican has hidden uh, treasures, I'm convinced, in Malta. And uh, the... Uh, the Freemasons have a um, Knights Templar, of course, Knights of Malta have a, a base there uh, that I believe uh, has probably a lot of secrets hidden in it, maybe even underground on a very significant power place, um, I'm, from, I'm told. Mm -hmm. I've interviewed a number of people on the island of Malta, investigators into the history uh, behind Malta, the links to Atlantis. I believe it was an outpost of Atlantis. There are people who believe uh, Malta is actually uh, was one of the centers of Atlantis. I don't think that's the case. However, there's no doubt whatsoever that it was a uh, a refuge, a place where they would hide uh, treasures and hide ancient knowledge, uh, even at the times of Atlantis. Um, so the secrets that are buried there are, are extensive. Wow! And, uh, and 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 the energetics there are also extensive. So. It is, um, it is something of a, a central pillar point on planet Earth, and as such, it, it draws in energies and um, also can send energies out. So if, uh, if you're wondering where the Vatican might go to, uh, to access um, sort of off-planet places, uh, Malta is, is a very likely candidate. Wow, that's awesome. And uh I hope you end up making it out there to do that serious investigation. That would be pretty groundbreaking, I think. Thank you. Yeah, I um I have already been there once and I, I did make a short film of it. It's it's available on my website for those interested. If you go to events uh on my across the top uh, and click on events, you can read all about my planned trip to Malta if you scroll down on that events page. Uh and yeah, a fascinating fascinating study. Man, we, we covered so much ground. Very awesome. I'm, I'm so glad we could do this and get as deep as we did. I'm glad I could meet you. I appreciate what you do and your time. But I guess before we really call it in, would you like to remind the people where they can keep up with what you're doing and with Project Camelot? Sure. Uh, ProjectCamelotPortal.com is one URL. Uh, ProjectCamelot.org is another that works. And ProjectCamelot.tv is uh, another one which should work. Let me say that I am putting together a, a television uh, channel, network, how, whatever you want to call it, uh, t bringing together the best hosts uh, in this sector from around the world. And uh, I've, I've been, uh, I actually did announce that on my website. We are working very diligently in that direction at this time. Uh, I think it's time that we, we put a lot of these people together in, in one place and give them you know, television shows in essence. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and also make sure they get paid for doing all the work they do. True. Uh, people don't realize that most of the people in radio simply don't make any money at all if you're on the internet. So I'm hoping to sort of change that, that paradigm. And also none of us intend to get rich doing this, but I, I do think that, um, if we have subscribers, uh, and eliminate, we'll have, um, we're going to make it available to, be a channel uh, with television shows, uh, as I say, for the best hosts out there. And then at the same time, be free on YouTube for people that are willing to watch ads and for people that uh, don't want ads if they subscribe and support the channel for uh, the very low amount of money, which is $2.99 or $3. Wow. I, you know, I haven't decided whether to eliminate that penny or not, but <laughs> <laughs> 
um, like to be dirt cheap a month on a monthly basis and yet ask people to support us and to to support the effort of all these hosts, you would be amazed at um, at how financially viable that that sort of uh, model is. Yeah. And and we're really hoping to to therefore make this possible to bring on the technical uh, help that we need to pay them. Uh, it's very hard nowadays to get anybody to help you technically if you don't pay them, as many people know. True. Um, and uh, we have a very hard time uh, staying a- alive, so we also welcome donations to keep the work happening. For people that wonder, I, I often uh, have a place to stay in Britain at this time, um, and I there from there I jump onto the European continent and I'm able to do speaking events to make my travel possible and pay for my hotels, which most people who invite me to speak can't afford to pay. <laughs> so this is what goes on. It's a weird trade-off, and it's it's a very convoluted kind of model. But uh, I, it, this is what I try to do, and uh, we're, we're always wondering how we're going to pay the rent from one month to the next. So that in mind uh, and, and help us to, to make this work possible, uh, I appreciate it. Yeah, well, that sounds great. I'm excited to see that roll out. Uh, I deal with that kind of business model myself, and it, it's working okay for me here. So I don't doubt that with all the great names coming together, you'll have a lot of success there as well. So best of luck there. And Carrie, thanks again for doing this. It has been an honor and a pleasure, and stay safe out there, all right? Okay, thank you so much, Greg. You got it. Take care. All right, bye-bye. Wow, guys, there it is. Many thanks to Carrie. I know she's usually on the other side of the interview, so coming by and being a guest on THC, not something she needed to do, so that was very cool of her. And we covered a lot of topics. False flags, Robin Williams, Joan Rivers, the raptor race of ETs, dolphin genetics, and so much more. Just the type of diversity I would hope for with a guest like Carrie. Also, as many of you know, I try to trim so much fat off what other shows are doing and get right down to business, all without third-party advertisers, because this show is supported by the Higher Side Chatters, who subscribe for the $5 a month, and as a result, they get a second hour of the five shows I put together every month. In this show with Carrie, we continued on to talk about portals and stargates and the hidden subtext to geopolitics and the ongoing effort by shadow governments to get a lockdown on these places. We talked about Obama and the mysteries behind him, the idea that he might have been cloned or genetically altered to fulfill the ancient prophecies some members of the power pyramid are a little obsessed with. 